This is Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 120, everything you need to know about McDonald's. Ronald McDonald in. Hand Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logie. I run RegainWellness.com and this is a Regain Wellness podcast. And if you're new here, thanks for coming on out. Um, I've got a whole bunch of previous podcasts, interviews, everything you could think of nutrition, fitness, health-wise. So go back and have a gander at everything there. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. Basically, anywhere you get podcasts, I'm pretty much there. iTunes would be the go-to, but um, I'm on like Stitcher Radio, iHeart Radio, uh, Google Play Music. Pretty much, yeah, anywhere you'd search for a podcast, I should be there. If I'm not, let me know, and I'll make sure I get there. So today is all about McDonald's and started off with a classic 80s commercial. I don't know if you remember that one, but uh, you can find these all on YouTube and they'll just have commercials through the years, through the 70s, 80s, and hilarious stuff. So I'll kind of break it into two parts. The first will be more of the history of McDonald's and how it came to be, which is actually a very interesting story. And I don't know if you seen have seen the movie The Founder, which was out uh, like less than a year ago. It's got Michael Keaton in it. Um, Laura Dern, Nick Offerman, and it's the the story of McDonald's. I think it's on Netflix now, depending on when you're listening to this. Um, it, it's an amazing story. It's a lot of um, shadiness and kind of, uh, I don't know, backhandedness by Ray Kroc, who's technically the founder. We, I'll explain all this, but um, yeah, amazing movie. And then I'll get, after that, I'll get into a you know, more of like the nutrition issues, health issues, some obscure facts. This show could be 10 hours long. I'm going to try and condense it as much as I can just to kind of give you the um, high points on everything. But I think it's just worth looking into because as, you know, we're aware of the issues with fast food and McDonald's, you know, by, well, I guess you don't want to say no fault of their own, but by kind of by design they lead the forefront of all fast food they always have so it's you know they're not immune from being looked at more deeply and just kind of peeling back the layers a little bit just to get some more insight into something that's been a part of everyone's life you know mine your yours wherever you live in the world mcdonald's is there you've experienced it you know exactly what we're talking about it's probably one of the most recognizable brand recognizable brands in the world so i think worth looking into so okay let's get started with a bit of the history so with mcdonald's here's where we're at now at the moment there's around thirty thousand locations Um, they're in more than 100 countries they collectively serve around 52 million people every day. They figure that at least 1% of the entire population of the earth is eating McDonald's every day, which is kind of baffling. Um, you know, like I said, one of the most recognizable brands on earth. Um, they One marketing firm found that in a survey of about 7,000 people in countries like the UK, Germany, Australia, blah, 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 everywhere. More people could identify the golden arches of McDonald's than they could identify the Christian cross. Um, it stands out more than even like Coca-Cola, you know, everything like that. So that's where it's at now. So where it comes from is, I don't know if you've, they're not in them as much now, but can you remember in a McDonald's when you go in and near the front counter, there would be this like bronze sort of, um, display like kind of like a plaque but like uh you know it's it had a face in it and it talked about ray Kroc and him being the founder and everything i don't know if you remember these they they might not have been everywhere but i can remember them being part kind of like a little you know history guide where you'd see on a monument or whatever and that's the little thing you might have wondered why the founder of mcdonald's was not named mcdonald's so the story goes back into 
almost into the 30s and the real McDonald's was started by two brothers named Dick and Mac McDonald. And I don't know who in the world would name a kid Mac McDonald, but that's just hilarious. So they started out as, you know, it's a tough time. It's a depression. They're struggling to do make a living. They're running a movie theater in California. They look across the way and they see uh, this hot dog stand that's doing a ton of business. So they figure this might be the way to go. Their idea, a lot of this, I mean, this information you can find everywhere online. I mean, History McDonald's is everywhere. And partly to do with the movie, they expand on it a bit. I think they get it, you know, like any movie based on a real story, they take a little bit of dramatic leeway. Um, And their idea was that, you know, depression or not, people still have to eat and people still want to, you know, sometimes treat themselves and go out and um, just to kind of get through the malaise of what they're going through in this era and depression. And, you know, so they, they think this might be the way to way to go. So they take a $5,000 loan and they start what's called the airdrome hot dog stand in 1937. So in 1940, they move it um, where are they in Arc- Arcadia, they move it to San Bernardino. Then they change the name to McDonald's barbecue. So it, uh, it does really well considering this era, um, when people don't have a lot of money and they, so it's going well, but they want it to do better and they want it to go faster. Um, so what they do is they shut down the place, um, for a few months, I think in 1948, which is potentially business suicide. Um, spe- well, anytime, but especially back then. And they take on sort of a new experimental approach. They're looking at all their, like they offered everything. If you look at the old McDonald's menus, they do. They did like hot dogs, fried chicken. They do burrito. They do everything. And they looked and saw the main things they were selling were burgers, fries, and milkshakes. So they thought instead of trying to be all things to all people, which is a big issue in the restaurant industry, let's focus on one um, thing and do that really well. So they, they ran it like old school, the... Not not like the drive-ins, but sort of based around that, where it would have, um, you know, car hops, the girls in roller skates who would come out, take your order, people would have to wait, and it was just, you know, not moving along as fast as they wanted to. So they started um, to, and it's one of the best scenes in the movie, where they go out onto Nick Offerman, who is... Um, Ray, oh, I can't believe I forgot that Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. That's blasphemy to forget one of the best characters on TV. So Nick Offerman plays one of the McDonald's brothers, and when they shut down, they go out and try to like reimagine how to more efficiently run um, a restaurant. So they go out to a tennis court, and they start in chalk drawing the outline of the kitchen. And where, you know, the fryer would be, where the drink machine, whatever. And they would go up on a ladder and have the staff, like, do a mock service and, or, you know, cooking and working through and seeing what would work as best as, you know, most efficient for position and time and using the space they had. And they would keep redrawing it and redesigning it till they had a very structured system that was not um, wasting any energy. So, you know, the one guy would, you know, finish the burgers, turn around, the right guy would be there. They would have this special machine they created that would hit it with five sort of splots of ketchup and mustard. There'd be a pickle guy. He'd hit it with two pickles, work it the way around. Um, So just like a well-oiled machine, basically. What they were doing was trying to copy what they saw that the auto industry was doing with Henry Ford and that idea of the efficiency, the kind of assembly line. And they called it the speed E system. So S P E E D E E system. Um, that worked really well. It not only paid off, but it started to set the standard for the rest of the food industry. So people are seeing, um, wow, they're reinventing the wheel here. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. The speedy system is pretty incredible. So at the time there was, um, a guy named Ray Kroc who was a, he, he sold milkshake machines. They were like, it was a machine that, um, had, I don't know what you call them, like little arm, like spindle things where you could hook up like five or six 
um, milkshakes at once so they could kind of rapid fire their way through it. One of his biggest customers was this restaurant McDonald's and he had worked, you know, he'd seen the ins and outs of the restaurant industry for a long time and they were buying like six or eight of these things at one shot and he'd think it was a mistake and he'd go down and he's seeing this amazing system that he'd never seen before um, and then just wanted to be a part of it. And as much as, you know, they, they created not McDonald's as we know it, but they got the ball rolling and Ray Kroc was the guy who took it to what it was, whether it was shady or not. Well, it was somewhat shady. Um, what he did, so they decided to, they would work together and they, they had tried to franchise before, but be, because the McDonald brothers couldn't be on each location, they couldn't keep up the quality and the standards they needed. And so they had, they had tried to open like three or four different ones that didn't work. And so they were kind of hesitant of letting someone else be involved with it, but um, writing up, you know, a, more of a, a ironclad contract that they had control of everything, no, even though he was what they thought only going to open up a couple more of these just in different locations. Um, so the problem was he starts it up, you know, it's going well, like the people love this sort of new fast food movement, but he wasn't bringing in enough revenue from his franchise restaurant. So part of his trouble was in getting the funds to pay for the land and the building for the restaurant. So in order to maintain control over the operations, Ray Kroc needed to franchise one store at a time rather than a whole slew of stores over a particular area or like geographic zone, which is what other food chains would normally do. So, you know, usually although the other food chains could attract big investors, the franchises um, or franchisees Ray Kroc attracted didn't have the funds to pay for the land and the building. So that's where he started to kind of, you know, wrap his hands around this whole um, evolution. Um, so he gave, um, ultimately, like he was trying to control the land, uh, owning a company that controlled the real estate that the franchisees or, and even the McDonald's brothers themselves couldn't uh, get past because they own the building, but he controlled the land. So they'd have to pay the rent. So he was kind of running two businesses at the same time. Um, and he took the success and the leverage he needed to get the loan uh, to basically buy out the McDonald's brothers in 1961. The franchises were going up so quick, like 1963, they, well, Ray Kroc opened his 500th McDonald's restaurant. So they were, you know, they were only pitching, like picturing maybe like five or 10 would open. And then he had the idea of taking this whole thing national. Like he, he knew it was a good product and the way he figured he could take control of it was by becoming essentially a real estate company um, and owning land all over the place. So he could get franchisees to buy locations because they didn't need as much startup capital because he owned where they were going to build. And so basically he had his hand in every single place, whereas opposed to today where someone can just, um, if they invest a ton of money, they can do whatever they want. They buy the land, they buy the building, but he kind of had a control over the whole thing. And then going way back into 63, that's, he brought in Ronald McDonald, um, originally played by actor Willard Scott. I think most people know that who was also the very first Bozo, the clown. So he saw that the way to go was families and kids and that kind of idea of building lifelong customers. And he took that approach of a kid's character, a cartoon. He used, he used a clown, which I don't know how people find clowns entertaining and amusing because they're all horrifying in some way. And um, so this kind of ties in. I did a big episode on the idea of advertising to children and in, especially like with fast food and McDonald's being at the forefront of aggressively and um, – you know, sort of in a very unbecoming way, a, a attacking kids through advertising and this idea of using like a clown figure and cartoons and whatever. So definitely if you want to go back and listen to that episode, that's episode um, 118. So if you go to regainwellness.com slash 118, you can see that. Basically, he was starting this entire new movement in all aspects. Um, so... 
basically, so now it's it's only like you know this is in the late. 30s they were first starting up by 63 he's got 500 restaurants in 1965 the company goes public um crocs making around three million bucks in a shot um he's two years later he's going outside the u.s he's uh i think canada if i'm not mistaken was one was the first place outside and where i live there's there's a mcdonald's that the location goes back to the 60s and i think it might have been i'll have to look this up it might have been the first um, McDonald's outside of the U.S. was in my town. Uh, then they go to Europe, Asia. In the next ten years, his wealth goes up to five hundred million. Um, even before that, twenty years before they go public, McDonald's was included in the thirty company Dow Jones Industrial Average. I mean, this is supersonic rise in 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 commerce and in their business. I mean, there's not a lot of companies that have ever done this in the history of the world. Um, they talk about that the company, you know, was a wise investment back in the day. And they would talk about in 1965, the idea of offering stock to employees um, because they, they could see this growth. They're saying around $2,000 worth of stock in 1965 would be, you know, translate to upwards of $3 million today. So, I mean, it just, like an unbelievable rise, which the original McDonald's brothers could not picture. I don't think any company could picture anything like this happening and that fast, you know, within almost like a 20 year period. Um, and them at the same time, basically getting screwed out of the picture as he took over their company. Um, they couldn't do anything about it. Like they tried to sue, but I mean, they didn't have the money to do it or the overhead costs or anything like that. And he bought them out. There was the idea, they I haven't been able to see this for sure, but in the movie, he because he couldn't um, make a contract work to buy him out, something like he gave him a million dollars um, each, and that he was going to offer them 1% of the profits every single year. And But they had to do it on a handshake agreement because um, he couldn't put that in... I don't know whatever to do with the lawyers that would that would give over too much control or too much asset or whatever but he had promised them handshake agreement that he would do it and a, a, that never went through and we you know 1% of McDonald's in a year is like 100 million dollars so another intentional or unintentional screw job so the thing though that Ray Kroc did was with this you know assembly line process and efficiency he was a real stickler for consistency, uh, he wanted to control the restaurants. He wanted to um, keep this idea of quality service, cleanliness, value um, into every franchisee who would run it. So, in in 1961, so that's the year he bought out the original McDonald's brothers. He established Hamburger University in the basement of a restaurant, and that is now in somewhere in Illinois. It's got its own facilities, and it serves as a place where the employees can earn what they call hamburgerology. Um, it actually they offer student college credit, um, and it's actually a respected corporate training program. McDonald's is seen as one of the best places a person can work, believe it or not, and it looks good on a resume because um, coming out of McDonald's, you learn all these. You learn to sort of like cross train in all these different areas, and you show that you can learn. Um, you can show that you've been adaptable because you're always put in different situations. So it looks good um, coming out of McDonald's because it shows you can really be a team player, kind of efficient um, value to a company. So they, you know, th so he was really pushing this idea to get a control over the people that are working for him so that they can follow his exact um, ideas and follow career paths that would be set out um, so that it would, you know, trickle down from the top to um, working all the way across. And then he would even let McDonald's managers or franchisees have a crack at inventing new items. Like the Big Mac was created by a franchisee. It wasn't a McDonald's creation. And same thing with, I don't know if it's the McRib, but a lot of different things where he'd give the, uh, the employees or the managers, he'd give them, a, you know, the creativity to kind of come up with their own thing. Same way like Pixar does that, where they allow their employees time to just go nuts and just come up with anything. Um, and that turns into movies, you know, just ideas they might not have thought of because they give their employees that, you know, comfort zone to experiment and create. So, 
Um, looking into some more, you know, moving into different areas now. Like I said, this this could be a days long podcast. I'm just trying to hit some uh, interesting thing. Um, as they're coming through, you know, it's running along like a well oiled machine. Um, then there's the issue in the 90s and 1992 of the uh, the temperature of its coffee. If you remember this idea, where a customer sued McDonald's after she spilled coffee in her lap, suffered third degree burns, she was in the hospital for eight days. Um, so I know this that that's been a long running joke. It's kind of like, well, of course the coffee is supposed to be hot, and this idea of you know idiot customers just spilling themselves to sue. But this is something that had been an issue for a while. McDonald's had had hundreds and hundreds of complaints that um, coffee was too hot. They'd been warned about this. So this was kind of like the tip of the iceberg or what would you say? The straw that kind of broke the camel's back there where they had to eventually pay up. So it wasn't like an obscure um, situation or whatever. Um, There's the issue of the, I don't know if you remember this, of the French fry scandals again in the 90s. They were saying um, McDonald's announced they would no longer cook fries in beef fat in case you didn't know, they always did cook the I mean, beef fat could give it more of a richer flavor and that they would move over, and over into vegetable oil. And this led many people to believe the fries had been vegetarian. So they, you know, vegetarians, vegans, Hindus, everyone kind of shocked to learn that these fries were uh, almost a meat product. Um, so they were sued for that. McDonald's points out they never claimed the fries were veg- vegetarian, but it was just one of those things but that's you know what they said made their um fries so good in 2002 what they ended up paying out i think like 10 million dollars um for this whole issue which is you know a drop in the bucket for a giant corporation like that and i mean they they settle so many things out of court on probably a daily basis um but it's not the worst thing for them because that idea of scandal is still, you know, almost there's no such thing as bad publicity. It always keeps them in the news. It always kept them in the news. Um, they're, you know, always criticized for having health damaging food and um, things like that. But they, McDonald's on their, I mean, it's in their their interests as opposed to being progressive and whatnot, but they're known for doing what they call glocalization. So when they'd move into a new market or a new country, they would adapt for the palates or the religious preferences um, wherever they would go. So like in India, they would put out variations of all their classics, but they wouldn't have beef. They I had I ate in Spain and they did some sort of, um, I can't remember what it was. It was some sort of rice bait, something you would never see anywhere else. So they, I mean, but again, like that's more about them kind of dominating and jumping into that market. So taking the recognized brand and then catering. I mean, I'm not saying they have merit in any sense, but they do adapt to wherever they go in. Um, They're really good for the Ronald McDonald house. Um, So that I don't, if in case you don't know that that's their charity they do. So it offers um, housing and lodging to parents so they can be close to a child who's receiving medical treatment far from home. And that's amazing, you know, stuff like that. Um, they've always done their donation boxes um, where customers can donate to the charity to help fund the house. Um, they do family room programs that are in hospitals so that they have, you know, TVs, computers, kitchens for where there's pediatric patients, families can relax. You know, they that's that's good stuff. I mean, they're still looking at a bottom line, but you know, if that's the way they, they go about it, that's pretty good. Um, then, you know, they've done stuff and they moved into moving into the happy meal, which was completely targeted at children. And they spend more money advertising the children than they do to teens and adults combined. And, you know, so where they're doing one thing nice with the Ronald McDonald house, they go ahead and do, you know, the Happy Meal. And it's it's not even as much about what's in the Happy Meal. I mean, you know, they're not huge servings and every now and then not a big issue. It's just the onslaught. They, they're spending $40 million a year just advertising the Happy Meal. 
to kids who can't, if you, if you don't get time to listen to that episode, please do about advertising to children. If you're under 12 years old, you really don't have the cognitive ability to distinguish between advertisements and TV. So when you're five or six years old, a cartoon and a commercial are the exact same thing. And McDonald's has really taken advantage of that over the years. Um, and their idea of kind of, you know, like hooking in a customer for life. And it's why they would put the play areas in the McDonald's. They want it associated with um, kids stuff and just growing up. And then the people would look back with nostalgia and fondness. And then they're, you know, kind of hooked in. So nu- nutrition wise, there's no mistaking the issues fast food has caused through, you know, obesity, heart disease, diabetes. I mean, you're dealing with food that is kind of the combination of all the worst things thrown together. So you're combining, um, you know, potentially genetically modified ingredients, uh, refined flours, refined carbohydrates, you're dealing with high fructose corn syrups. You're dealing with trans fats. You're you're dealing with hormone treated feedlot confinement lot beef that you know with one hamburger patty potentially containing dozens even a hundred different cows into one thing. So it's it's kind of all these um, issues you want to stay away from. Again, not just McDonald's. I mean, you know, it's it's fast food across the board. With places, you know, probably being worse, I'd say like KFC, Taco Bell. I mean, they're not far worse, but I'd say a bit worse. So that's, you know, there's no surprise. We know fast food is not good for us. And it's why you've seen McDonald's start to move away from this now. And they're offering healthy alternative options. And salads and customizable meals and like you can get kale salads at mcdonald's and and to me it's a sign that they're not that they're scrambling but you know they they kind of coast along forever just serving the same crap and it's kind of like you come in mcdonald's you know what you're getting you know what you signed up for when you walk through the doors and now with more of a healthy food movement and, and just as much more education about the dangers of a lot of these ingredients and and stuff that there's a demand and they're having to adopt where as before they would kind of set the trend. You know what I mean? They'd bring out the um, double quarter pounder with cheese and they'd bring out the McRib and they wouldn't even think twice about that. And like I said, leading the way. And now that people, you know, once, you know, a company like Subway for a while became the number one fast food place, they've had to play catch up a little bit. (laughs) That was brutal. Never mind. Ignore that. If I can edit that out, like, catch up catch up joke so with like the other companies um, or other fast foods they like they settle in and they just do their thing and they haven't strayed from that so you have to kind of respect that a little bit so I mean to me it, like I said I've worked in a lot of different restaurants and when a restaurant tries to become all things to all people with a huge variation across the board in their menu and their foods that's when they tend to go belly up the best places are restaurants that do one thing and they do it really well as opposed to, you know, those places, or if you've ever been to like, um, I don't know, not even like a buffet, but a place that offers like Mexican food, but they also have like Chinese food. And then, yeah, those tend not to last long as opposed to one place that does something very well. So McDonald's did very well, crappy, but very tasty foods and hamburgers and fries and milkshakes. And once you move away from that, that, you know, I, I, to me, it's like, if I know that's what I want, I'm going to McDonald's. I'm not going to McDonald's because I want a kale salad. I can get that anywhere and a lot better version of it too. Like with a lot of fast food salads, they tend to be nutritionally worse than the hamburgers or whatnot. Like McDonald's salads, I mean, these are always changing and it depends on the region, but like they would do those um, Southeast Asian type salads that have like a grilled sort of chicken on and dressing those things will have more calories they'll have more fat um and 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 higher sugar content than like the big macs or whatnot so in some of those cases you're better off going with just the burgers so as they're trying to you know customize things but still ending up with the same problems i think the required viewing for everyone um if you haven't already seen it is super size me the documentary um 
where what's his name Morgan Spurlock I think and he in case you haven't seen this he goes on an all McDonald's diet for 30 days the with the idea there was I think this is in the early 2000s there was lawsuits from families or you know from kids that were eating McDonald's all the time and getting fat from it and however it it came up they were you know suing McDonald's for this and McDonald's said no you can eat this food um, as long as you don't go overboard or whatnot or eat it consistently and there's not going to be necessarily problems so Morgan Spurlock takes on this 30-day McDonald's challenge where he's eating three meals a day and if you've seen the movie he knows what happens how how sick he gets and the composition of his body changes and he gains like 30 pounds and all his, you know, hormonal markers drop, his blood's coming back in terrible, terrible shape. Um, all because of McDonald's and, you know, they're, they're not saying it was healthy, but they're saying, Oh, it's not doing the damage you think. And this is what happens after 30 months. I mean, you've probably seen this movie. If you haven't definitely watch it just to kind of get an idea where it's at. So like I saying, ultimately, they're in the business of junk food and crap. And as they try to evolve, who knows where it'll go to with so many other options out there. Are they better just sticking with what they did before or is in 10 years from now, are they even, you know, not even going to offer fries or milkshakes anymore and convert the whole thing. It'll be very interesting to see uh, kind of what happens. So some of the specific issues with foods and ingredients. So the biggest one right off the bat and probably you don't need more past this is that the food has no biological value. That means there's no, you know, it might be made of quote unquote real ingredients, but the way it's so processed and so full of additives and essentially preservatives um, make it that you're really getting little to no nutrition at all from them. And like when I say biological value, that's, basically meaning the realness of food. So like if I leave an apple core out on the counter, it's going to turn brown, it's going to decompose, it's going to rot. That's biological value and um, moisture content. And that's a big thing in the foods. McDonald's food has none of that. So it's why their food basically never rots or breaks down because it's so devoid of real nutrients and real nutrition. And it's like if you've, you know, you've found old fries in your car, they could be two years later and they're the exact same. They don't break down. But if you made your own fry at home out of potato, it's going to rot and decompose a bit. Same thing with the burgers. There's no moisture. There's nothing in them. You can leave them out on the counter. I'll I'll put some pictures up. If you go to the show notes today, which will be regainwellness.com slash 120, so 120, um, I'll put the pictures of where Uh, People do this where they've left out a burger, you know, for six weeks, six months, whatever, and just show the the transition of the photos over the time and nothing happens to the burger. They won't, you can even put, if you're outside, put a McDonald's hamburger down or fries and no bugs or flies will land on it where they'll land on anything that's uh, because it's, it's not recognized as real food. Like even insects don't acknowledge this as being something real and you can put it down. So I'll put some of those pictures up where they, they do this in super size me too. I think it's in this special or the extras or whatever, the extra scenes where they take a real burger and real fries. Um, and then McDonald's one and their fries and they keep them covered and they check back every couple of weeks, six weeks, whatever. And the real stuff, you know, rotted to all hell. And then the McDonald's stuff, absolutely no change in it. And that's because of the amount of, additives and preservatives and chemicals and stuff that basically takes out all the nutrition. Um, Huge amounts of salt and sugar, you know, like there's sugar in burgers, you know, like in the bun, like their, their fries, I think have 14 different ingredients that make up what they put into it. Um, That's, I mean the, you know, sugar in burgers, like anything they can do to make the meals more tasty, to give them more mouth feel, um, that like our, our mouths really desire and crave like that fat feel. Um, and that can be accomplished not only with the fat, but with sugars as well too. Um, the interesting thing is though Ray Kroc was 
I think pretty much um, somewhat OCD because he had this real obsession with cleanliness and whatever, which is very good in a restaurant. But he kind of coined that phrase, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean, which if you work in a restaurant is probably making you violently ill hearing that. Um, so they would be super hygienic, but at the point now where they're very like, say on top of keeping bathrooms clean and whatnot, they neglect sometimes other things. And they're finding that there was 70% more bacteria in the drink machines than the toilets in a McDonald's because they wouldn't keep those machines necessarily as clean. And that's the problem with, um, things that have a lot of high contact with sugar is that they can develop mold and bacterias, um, and just, you know, kind of get worse over time. It's the reason like cola based drinks like Coke and everything they use, um, phosphoric acid because it helps that amount of sugar. Um, like I said, can lead to too much bacteria developing the phosphoric acid helps kind of negate this a bit. Um, and it's also gives kind of that bite flavor, that sharpness to drinks, but it's so, um, potent that um, it can be used to remove like lime scale from toilet bowls and it can actually break down your bones um, and even your teeth and stuff. So that's a trade-off there. Let's talk about chicken McNuggets. Um, they were kind of invented to be a snack size. They're supposed to look like the size and shape of your thumb to um, be more of like a playful type toy. They invented Birdie, the flying bird. Um, I don't know actually if she was, she might've been more associated with breakfast foods, whatever. Anytime they'd roll out different foods, they'd bring in different, uh, characters. Like I think Grimace was the, uh, milkshake, whatever, you know, watch, watch these. I'll put some of these old McDonald's commercials up where they're actually kind of terrifying some of them. So chicken McNuggets, um, not surprisingly, there's very little chicken in the nuggets. They're kind of like a chicken mash. That's combinations of who knows how many parts of different birds. Um, pretty much they're mostly fat connective tissue and even some bone in there. Um, they're, they're stored frozen until they're ready to use. And again, all those chemicals help keep them fresh. They use one which I can't even pronounce. It's, let me try it. T-butylhydroquinone. So it's T-B-H-Q. And it's um, part of, you know, made up of different things like acetone, um, alcohols. It, it's a preservative to keep things fresh. And these compounds can cause, you know, liver issues, neurotoxic effects, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, the milkshakes, I don't know if these are as big now. I don't know if people go to McDonald's for milkshakes, but if they do, they're, they're a handful of ingredients, but and they sound pretty much um, benign if you exclude, you know, the coloring preservatives. But the big thing is one of the ingredients is called artificial flavor. Not surprisingly, lots of products use those things. But what they do, what fast food companies, actually a lot of um, junk food or whatever, is they can combine a ton of different ingredients and then put it under one category and then only have to list that as opposed to having to put all those individual things. So with like Burger King was known for this, like with their strawberry milkshake, it contained artificial strawberry flavor. Under that heading, there were 43, I, it might've been 53 different ingredients that made up artificial strawberry flavor. And strawberry does not appear once in the whole thing. It's just a cocktail of chemicals and stuff. So even though these things might only list five ingredients, when it comes to fast food and junk food, one of those ingredients can be dozens of different things um, under that sort of umbrella of whatever flavor. I mean, some of these, they'll use dyed, you know, kind of chemical um, they call uh, ethyl val can't even say this valerates, which create like you know an apple flavor or a strawberry flavor or a blueberry flavor when none of this stuff is anything like that. Um, and you know they couldn't even the the product itself would not be big enough to contain all the different individual ingredients that go into it. Um, let's see what else do we got? Like I talked about the salads. Um, always a big issue. I mean, if you're, if you're going there and you order these things, like at least get the dressings separate. 
because that tends to be what contains most of the crappy saturated fat, all the sugars, all the stuff. Um, if, if they happen to have some sort of oil vinaigrette, they might carry them. I'm not sure. Um, go for something like that. The cheese, um, man, I mean, processed cheese on a good day is not good, but in, in McDonald's and in fast food places, they, they're more aptly called cheese colored chemicals. Um, only slightly over half of what you buy that's called processed cheese is actual cheese made from milk. Um, and there's distinctions among labeling a product, pasteurized cheese food, pasteurized processed cheese product, imitation cheese, um, that vary with the amount of actual dairy that's in them. So with the, um, the pasteurized processed cheese product has less than 51% actual milk, which, you know, whatever, not too bad, but the, the processed cheese that you see like in a fast food place is 5% or less actual milk. So there's a little bit in there, but not enough to really call it any form of cheese or dairy. Here's a correction as I'm looking through. I said McDonald's fries contain 14 ingredients. They contain 17 ingredients. So may as well go through them here. Potatoes, canola oil, hydrogenated soybean oil, safflower oil, natural flavor, quote, vegetable source, dextrose, sodium acid, pyrophosphate, which maintains color. I didn't know potatoes needed color. Citric acid, which is a preservative. Um, dimethylpolysiloxane, which is an anti-foaming agent part of why you know when it's cooked in the oil um and then the vegetable oil that it's cooked in canola oil corn oil soybean oil hydrogenated soybean oil all with that thbq that word i couldn't say before citric acid and dimethylpolysiloxane and salt and in their salt it contains silicoluminate dextrose sugar and potassium iodide all under that thing so kind of ridiculous um other fact, the Egg McMuffin was modeled after Eggs Benedict. I don't think they hit it exactly on the mark, but close. Um, they, oh, like I was mentioning with the toy issue and the cartoon thing. This, this is interesting, which I did not know until I was researching this. McDonald's is the world's largest distributor of toys. Think about that for a sec. With the amount, like think of Lego to... GI Joe to kids toys over the years. Um, all the companies that are involved um, from Toys R Rust to whatever. And McDonald's is the number one distributor in the world of toys. Um, it's amazing. And 20% of McDonald's sales involve Happy Meals. So you can see why they spend $40 million a year advertising Happy Meals. And then again, the tie-ins. Burger King was probably a bit bigger with this for a while was the tie-ins with merchandising with movies um whether they were completely directed at kids or not and now obviously all fast food um has a tie-in with some connection to kids i like the uh fact here that if the filet of fish which probably the most disgusting item if you think about it fast food fish was created because um at the time period i don't know if this is in the 60s again or in the early 70s where People were maybe a little more um, committed, you know, as far as the Catholic Church and then um, eating fish on Fridays, if you're familiar with that. And they, McDonald's, they were actually noticing that their burger sales would go way down because people were a little more, um, I don't know, consistent with that sort of thing. So they invented the filet of fish to kind of, you know, bring back that crowd a little bit. Um, and then <laughs> they were going to replace it after a while when people were whatever not as adamant on having the friday fish thing they were going to um replace it with something called the hula burger which was just going to be a slice of pineapple on an uncooked bun um <laughs> which is hilarious um just a few other there's so many of these random facts but a lot of them find amazing they were mcdonald's had this big push in the 90s where as there was growing fast food competition and you know the different ways to market were starting to change it wasn't the the same old you know commercials on tv and people's interests were going different places you know 
back then, let alone to now. They so what they were going to do was trying to pay rappers to drop the name Big Mac in their songs because the Big Mac the sales were plummeting for whatever reason. So the deal was that they were going after all the big time guys, you know, like Tupac, everyone back then. So the idea was they were going to make. Rappers were going to make $5 every time a song mentioning the Big Mac was played on the radio and they would track that whole thing, which is a lot of money if you think about it. But no rapper, not like Jay-Z, Notorious B.I.G., Ludacris, and no rapper was willing to take up McDonald's on that. And if you think about rappers and hip hop are the biggest sellouts in anything, like in the music business, in any form of entertainment they you know would look at them promoting like vodkas and cars and grill like all kinds of crap and no rapper wanted to take on mcdonald's so that one hurts a little bit they um they've stopped tracking the burger count if you remember they'd say you know over 99 billion served and i don't know like if you listen to jerry seinfeld's thing he's like okay i'll take one he's like who are they trying to impress with the 99 billion served so now they've stopped um, counting and now they just say billions and billions served. And I don't even know if the places say that anymore. And we can't talk about McDonald's without remembering in the mid ish nineties, McDonald's pizza. Do you remember this? I don't know if the, like I live in Canada, this was across North America. I don't know if this was a worldwide thing per se, but they McDonald's did pizza. And as a younger, I think it was like 15 or 16. I actually thought it was pretty good. They, it was kind of weird. They had this weird sort of onion based crust and they brought in, I don't know if you remember this marketing campaign that went out and all these McDonald's had the big um, pizza cooking oven things that are now in these like massive landfills all over the place. Cause I don't even think it lasted a year and you could get a personal size one and a family one or a bigger one. And they, so like I said, I thought they were okay, but it's kind of hilarious to think that McDonald's did pizza and it didn't work because it took way too long to, I think it was up to like 20 minutes to get one of these things cooked, which in a fast food restaurant does not work. Um, and they couldn't, you know, just maintain it. Is it the reason, you know, people always wonder why doesn't McDonald's do hot dogs? And cause they started with hot dogs, but Ray Kroc, his thought was, that because no one really knows what goes in the hot. Well, we know it's a lot of crap, but they couldn't, you know, have any sort of quality control and what went into the hot dogs when originally like they did have better quality beef, but as it expanded and got bigger and bigger, um, that all went out the window and that they couldn't, you know, maintain the quality in the, what was potentially going into the hot dogs, which is kind of funny because now when there's no quality going into the food, hot dogs could have just, slip right in again. I don't know why that's something they never um, got back into. I don't know if there's just a, that demand for hot dogs is just not there. Okay. I'll probably wrap it up here. Like I said, I can go on forever. Maybe I'll do another show on more McDonald's facts and, and stuff, but there's a lot of crazy stuff out there. So, but if you've listened to this, go and check out um, the show notes. So that's just information on what I talked about today on my website. So it's regainwellness.com slash one, two, zero. And I'll, I'll link up some of those images I was talking about. Um, some of the, like the other podcast I mentioned about the, the advertising, the children thing, maybe I'll throw a few of those, uh, YouTube commercials up there. So a little bit, of everything to check out after. And while you're at it, if you haven't already, you can sign up for the regain wellness newsletter. So it's an email I send out only every couple of weeks and it's just got, you know, nutrition information and education I think you'd find relevant um, stuff I basically only share over email um, and it comes with a free there's a free ebook when you sign up it's just a short guide that's got a little more information on foods you want to be including um, things you want to be avoiding and why I talked about a bunch of them already today but a little more insight there it's got some recipes and you can get that um, when you're at so regainwellness.com slash guide and you can just throw in your email and it's all done there okay I'll end it up here. That's enough McDonald's for one time. Thanks for listening. Um, like I said, if you're new here, make sure you subscribe, but I appreciate you stopping by. I know there's a ton of different podcasts out there. So the fact you're listening to this one, that means a lot. So I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.